was Johnny. They're all gonna laugh at you. They're all gonna laugh at you. Get away from her, you bitch. We all go a little mad sometimes. Haven't you? Let's face it, baby. These days, you gotta have a sequel. You fly back to school now, little Starling. Hello and welcome to another episode of Once Upon a Nightmare. As always, I am your host, Lorraine Purden, and I'm here to discuss the horrors of the world, both fictional and real. This week, I'm going to chat about the second film for my John Carpenter month. We are going all the way back to 1995, and this is The Village of the Dam. At precisely 10 a.m. in a quiet seaside village, something happened. Something unexplainable, something unbelievable. There's a lot of pregnancies, much more than would normally be expected. All the pregnancies seem to date from the day of the blackout. Oh no. Now, this town is about to discover that looks can kill. There have been a few casualties. I should say, accidents. That might be related to contact with the children. My daughter was involved. Who are they? They have one mind that they share between them. Father? Let us pray. You've been discussing us with Dr. Vern. What did she tell you? You're hiding something. The police can't do anything to stop the children. Get out while you can. Something so much more powerful than we'll ever be. What are you gonna do? The only thing that we can do. You can't stop us, you know. Don't try. Village of the Damned is based on the 1957 novel by John Wydham, The Midwich Cuckoos. I think this was my first time watching this. If it's not, I completely forgot what it was about. And I also forgot that there was a remake, and that was released in 1960. The director of that was Wolf Rilla, and he got a writer's credit for the remake, along with John Wydham and Sterling Siliphant. Village of the Damned stars the late Christopher Reeve as Dr. Alan Shafee. Now, most would know Reeve as Superman, the best Superman in my opinion. I do love Henry Cavill, but Reeve will always be number one. And this film, along with Above Suspicion and some other major roles, was meant to be his comeback. 1995 was supposed to be his year. Now, he did have a lot of success with Superman, but after that, not so much, especially with lead roles. But he would have a riding accident, horse riding accident, and become paralyzed from the shoulders down, and would unfortunately pass away on October 10th, 2004. It also stars the late Kirsty Alley as Dr. Susan Werner, Mark Hamill as Reverend George, and Crocodile Dundee's Linda Kozalski as Jill McGowan. A strange occurrence happens over the small town of Midwich when the entire town would pass out at the same time. After this, the town would have multiple pregnancies, but these pregnancies would not cause the joy one would expect when expecting. All the babies would be born on the same day, and they all pretty much acted and looked the same. The residents of Midwich need to watch their backs from these creepy kids. Kids that kill in movies, for me, they add that bit of terror. From what I can see, this came into play in 1956 with a movie called Bad Seed. A cute eight-year-old girl kills people when she doesn't get her way. And we have had many since then. Children of the Corn, The Omen, The Good Son, to name a few. We do not expect children to be so evil. We see them as innocent. We see them as people who need our protection. And yes, they do. But there are some kids out there in real life, unfortunately, that show us what kids can actually do. We have Jamie Bolger case. We've got Mary Bell, the Bever brothers. There are so many cases that show us what kids can be capable of. But there is confusion when kids do things like this, as we do not feel we can treat them the way we would an adult. But these kids grow up. While it can be hard to wrap your head around it, there is something just a bit more terrifying Personally, for me, 
when kids kill in movies. They're so creepy, and this film is no different. With this movie, they are not exactly human, so as a viewer, you don't really care what happens to them, apart from David, of course. When you see what they're capable of and how they feel or don't feel, should I say, game over. This is sci-fi horror, and it did get a bad rap, and I personally don't agree with that. I'm a lover of psychological horror and sci-fi horror, and I do feel that while we get the sci-fi, this film does mess with your mind a bit. I feel when the kids are acting the way they are, it's very unsettling to watch, and I guess I haven't gotten over Eden Lake yet. <laughs> I never will. Plus, you know these kids have one agenda, and they will not veer from that. The film bombed and I mean bombed at the box office, and got a lot of negative press. It had a budget of around 22 million, but only made just under 9.5 million worldwide. Apparently, a lot of the budget actually went on Reeves, Ali, and Hamill. It was also nominated for a Razzie for the worst remake, but the Scarlet Letter would win that prize. I've also read that Carpenter was never really fully invested in the project, and it was just a film he had to do but Carpenter wanted to do a remake of The Creature from the Black Lagoon, and that would be made after The Village of the Damned. Now, Lagoon was said to be a passion project, but as this movie did not do so well, it never happened. He did praise Reeves, though, for his performance, and he said that that's what gave the film some value, and I would have to agree. Reeves' performance was spot on, and he definitely carried the film for me. But despite all that, I actually liked the film, despite all that negative press. It's... Uh, not my favourite John Carpenter movie, no. I mean, you can't beat Big Trouble in Little Chinatown and, of course, Halloween. But I did like it. It was something a bit different and it made me nervous as I sat and waited to see what these kids were actually going to do. The small town of Midwich is one where everyone knows everyone. Filming took place in multiple locations in California. Midwich would be probably a place where not much happens as people go about their day-to-day -day lives. We see a house being shown to someone that had the white picket fence, a place to have the American dream. But this town is about to change in a way they could have never imagined. When we see the mass pass out of the residents, this in itself is bizarre, but it also has a boundary, which I find even more bizarre. When people flock towards them, the authorities, we see that there is a cutoff for how far you can go before you too will pass out. So this rules out any sort of like chemical contamination because that wouldn't have such a cutoff mark. And most people, they did actually wake up, apart from one poor fella who, unfortunately, when the mass uh, pass out happened, he was cooking a barbecue. So he kind of fell onto the barbecue. And I think it lasted for like six hours or something. And he got cooked. So yeah, that fella did not wake up. But while this is the case and all of a sudden many women become pregnant, they are given the option to abort, but no one does. Is this because there is some way like the little alien babies uh, are not letting them or did they just not want to? I get it, but I also think the whole thing, it kind of warrants a bit more concern. Like no one, no one did it. No one had an abortion. Plus, some hadn't even had relations with a man and were still pregnant. And of course, money became involved. So they were told if they have kids, they'll get the certain amount of money. And then there was this dad in the audience who got very excited because he had a wife and a daughter. And he asked, would he get double because both his wife and his daughter were pregnant? What a knob. But he was so excited. I was just like disgusted. Dr. Werner, a.k.a. Katie Alley, will play a big part in this as she is working for the government and you do wonder, is she actually good or bad? You're kind of toying between that. There are moments you feel she is there for the good, but as we soon find out, this has happened before and she knew about it. You know she knows what this could mean if everyone had their babies and she still lets it happen. So no one's really to be trusted, but then can you force someone to have an abortion? Obviously not. So... You're constantly on the fence about her. I go back and forth. So all the babies, born at the same time, same day, and everything about them appears to be the same. They all have white coloured hair. Charlotte Gravener was the hairstylist on this film, and she's actually done loads. I, I IMDb'd her, and the amount of film and TV work she has done is insane. She would bleach the hair of the children and spray white hairspray to the hair and that must have damaged the shit out of their hair. I've got dark hair and I've bleached it and honestly it turns to straw. But it did look quite smooth. So she does a great job with these kids. So of these white haired babies, they would of course need a leader. And this would be Mara. She is played by Lindsay Horn, 
And they all kind of fall in line with her. She's one of the kids that you can tell is basically in charge. They walk in single file in two lines and it would appear they all have a partner. So they've been matched up with another child. All but one. And that is David, played by Thomas Decker. And he's a bit different to the others. And you feel with him that there's some hope for these children. If they didn't have a partner, then there's kind of something more there. David's mate was stillborn. She was born to the only virgin who was impregnated. And that that in itself didn't seem to alarm people. These children have no emotions. They do feel threatened you feel at times, or is it just pure hatred when something's not going their way? If they feel this threat, they will cause you to basically self-destruct in some way. They don't physically touch you or hurt you, but they get you to do it to yourself. We really see this with Mara and her mother. And this is when Mara is still like in a high chair. So she's still a baby at this stage. And we see what these kids are actually capable of. And the worst thing is, in this scenario, the mother is simply making dinner. Having made dinner for Mara, she causes her to really hurt herself. She gets her mother to put her hands in this boiling water, but she can't seem to take them out. And she's screaming like crazy, but she just can't seem to move. It's only when Jill comes in and helps her. And then she just takes her own life by simply walking off of a cliff. Mara, the psycho, as I like to call her, causes all this. And she's kind of just chilling with this grin on her face, like there's just nothing there. And when it comes to the deaths... This one I really didn't get. There was no threat. The mother wasn't actually doing anything like when you see the others, which I'll mention. Kind of something's going on. But this this particular occasion, the mom's just making dinner. I don't know, maybe she made a meal the kid didn't like. But let's face it, this is Mara. And in hindsight, to what she becomes, this shows that she had it going on from a very early age. She just likes causing harm to others when they can harm her or not. We know this is happening when their eyes turn orange, white, yellow color. So when that happens, you know you're in trouble. The original idea for the children was for them all to have like black eyes with white, uh, bluish center the whole time. And this was meant to be done through contact lenses, but getting the children to wear them was an issue as apparently they really hurt and they were so uncomfortable. I myself wouldn't be able to put one in, so I'm on board with that. So this was scrapped and the effects we see with the eyes was put in later by ILM. So that was all animated. ILM is Industrial Light and Magic. It's a visual effects company founded in 1975 by the great George Lucas. He created it when Star Wars was in production and a lot of movies do use this. So this helped with saving the kids the ordeal of trying to put these contacts in every day. And let's face it, saving the person that would have had to get them in. So everyone's a winner in this case. After these deaths start happening, we really see the impact on not just people, but also the town. The town's starting to look a bit empty, unkept. The streets aren't that tidy. And it doesn't really look like a community as such. It's not really thriving the way it once was. Um, Once there's another accident on a resident, you know, the priest starts to question Dr. Werner and she knows about the safety of the people and she knows they're not safe, but she doesn't kind of tell them to run for the hills. So that's another moment where you're like, hmm. I think one thing this film does have, though, is a lot of sadness. And I don't mean because of the deaths, which are obviously sad. I mean the interactions that you see between parent and child. Take David out of the equation for a second. And let's really focus on Mara and Alan. And why we do see it with the other children, obviously these two are kind of pushed in front of us a lot more. And I really do feel sorry for Alan. He's lost his wife. He's got a child who basically has no use for him, but for her, him to serve what she needs. And you hear of cases with children who do not connect with their parents. I mean, these kids obviously are psychopaths. They don't care about their parents. And, you know, it must be really hard for some families that your your kid is just like looking right through you. They feel nothing. And here there's no bond. And Mara just seems so spiteful. And unlike David and the others, to be fair, although we don't get much focus on them, she's definitely in control of everyone and she can really throw a dirty look. But with Mara, you feel she can never be redeemed. There is no getting through to this girl. She could never be rehabilitated. She's pure evil and basically someone who should be locked up and never released. David, though, he's not robotic like the others. 
he gets that a part of him is missing. I suppose he feels a loss, I guess. And through that, he starts displaying signs that he can empathize with others because he doesn't have his partner. And the real sign for me was when he held Alan's hand. Alan is looking over the grave of his wife and David gets that he has lost. And when he holds his hand, you can see that Alan and him are kind of like there together. But Alan is in shock because he can now see that maybe they're not all bad like Mara. There is some hope. David was played by Thomas Decker and he continued to act quite a bit after this, actually. If you go on and look at his IMDb, there's quite a lot there. And he would make an appearance in uh, the 2010 Nightmare on Elm Street, but I'm not allowed to talk about that film because I don't say nice things. The <laughs> but it's okay to like it. The other kids also see that David is a bit different. They feel he has too many emotions. His mother, Jill, really does care about David, though, and she sees the difference with him and others. For her, she sees that she may actually get to have the child as her child. like Not like the others who spend most of their time worried about saying the wrong thing because they're going to get their eyes zapped. So when you look at all the other parents, they're kind of like tiptoeing around their kids worried. Whereas with David, she can kind of be more of a normal mother. As these kids have no desire to kind of like blend in with society, they're soon put into another class away from the other children because it's not fair on the regular kids. You know, they're all a bit nervous too. Alan becomes their teacher because they think that maybe there's a chance that he could talk to them. And you see that that's not going to happen very quickly. She's not, Mara's not budging from how she acts and what she believes. To her, her way is the only way. And Mara is the person who would bring you to the breaking point of frustration, I have to say. We have all been in that situation where you just want someone to listen, to stop being an asshole, and they just don't care. We all know how infuriating that can be. And here with Mara, there is that and more. Everything she says is in this condescending way. There's one scene with her and Alan in the barn where he's trying to get her to feel, have compassion, to show some sort of human emotion. But her response is just cut to the core. He's almost begging her to see that there can be another way. And I'm just going to play a little clip here for you to really get how it comes across. And like, you're kind of watching this girl and you just want to... I don't believe in hitting people, but you just want to shake her. Another man is dead. Why do you hate us so much, Mara? It isn't a matter of hate. It is a biological obligation. You are thinking of what happened to the others. Then our actions shouldn't surprise you. We have to survive no matter what the cost. We are the only ones left now. Well, I don't see why we can't reach an understanding. And why can't we just live together? If we coexist, we shall dominate you. That is inevitable. Eventually, you will try to eliminate us. We are all creatures of the life force. Now it has set us at one another to see who will survive. That's a cruel sport. Life is cruelty. We all feed on each other. Exploit each other in some way to survive. I don't agree with you. I think that adaptation is the key to survival. Cooperation, and symbiosis, and compassion. Why do you think your own survival depends upon emotion from us? Should we pity you? Empathize with your plight? You should feel! You should feel something! Without feelings, you're nothing. You're just second-rate mimics of a higher organism. That's right, a higher organism. We're your superiors in our capacity to love. Without compassion, you're a doomed species. Emotion is irrelevant. It is not our nature. Like, could you hear how unfazed she was by him? Like, she feels nothing. It's such a sad existence for her, but it's her only existence. She knows no different. She feels no compassion. And it's just horrible to watch. Alan and Jill, though, are the only ones that seem to really get how bad these kids are. I mean, maybe parents know but sometimes you just don't want to believe it and obviously they know what these kids are capable of so they want to keep their noses out of it but the janitor's death kind of makes everyone stand up and take notes you can't really avoid it now and yes he did hit one of the kids with a broom I did feel like it was a bit of an uh, accident but he went into the room he was taunting them so they of course got their zappers on and this is kind of that moment as well afterwards where you feel is Dr. Werner evil because we do spend a lot of time thinking that she doesn't care. 
Um, but the children can read her mind and she spent a lot of time stopping them getting too far into her head. And Werner, you know, she's mysterious in a sense. She almost comes across like some sort of femme fatale as she dresses in almost black, smoking a cigarette. She definitely has the look and has somewhat of this seductive nature about her. You know, she asks for what she wants and she takes this, you know, take charge attitude. And then there's that scene where we feel she's evil because she quickly removes a stillborn child who's the one from the Virgin. And we wonder, is the baby actually dead? And did she kill the baby? So there's a lot of mystery around her. But when she realizes, and this is kind of when we go, okay, okay, but a little bit too late, isn't it, at this stage? But when she realizes how out of control everything's getting, she does try and warn Alan. She shows him this like weird alien in a jar, but she does try and warn him. And one of her reasons, which I get, is if she puts this stuff into people's heads and tells them, look, this is what could happen, then the kids can read their minds. So I do think that she was trying to protect them. She She's in this situation where she's doing kind of the best she can. So after all this and we find out, I kind of think to myself, okay, she was protecting them by keeping stuff from them because the kids can read their mind. So that does make a lot of sense. Now, after this, the kids decide we want to be on our own. We want to live in the barn. This is the barn where they were born. And we see all the kids. It's really weird the way the cars just drive up and, you know, let them out one by one. They just drop the kids off with not so much as a goodbye, to be honest with you. And off they go. Um, Jill does try to stop David, but as he says, she has no choice. As we're kind of into the last 40 minutes now, the kids are not done with the deaths. Peter misses, uh, nearly misses one with a car. So, you know, that's not an issue, but he wants to take his daughter. So they make him crash his car into a gas tank. George, they make him shoot himself. The Virgin's already killed herself and the preacher's wife, she forms like this mob. We're going to take them over. We've got burning fire and everything. But, um, you know, these things never go well and she sets herself on fire. But it's so weird. She just stands there as she sets herself on fire and the flames are going. Dr. Werner does then try to speak to them. But obviously we see that it's it's gone too far now. It's gone past. And they then turn on her. I think with her, she did think that at one point she kind of had these kids under some sort of control. But we see that that's not the case. And they kind of make her like stab herself and rip a, a blade up her central the center of her stomach, and we can see that this is painful in her eyes. Her eyes are, and her face is showing pain, um, but then she just dies. And then it just turns into the biggest massacre going, and the police turn up, and the way they just kind of turn each on each other, and they have this big shooting match, and it's really weird watching them kill each other, And because I guess that's something we don't tend to see, is it? When the cavalry comes in, it's to fight the enemy. And as we've seen throughout the movie, people are helpless when it comes to these little sweet, innocent kids. Uh, and they put on these like Jedi mind tricks and they can wipe out masses of people. You know, up until now, it's kind of been a one thing, a one person thing. But they take on a lot here and they just wipe them all out. But Alan has found a way to stop them from getting in his head and he's able to block the thoughts. And at the end, it kind of becomes this fight between Mara and Alan. And he's kind of keeping his cool. He's trying to get David out of the way because basically he wants to blow them up. But Mara knows something isn't right and she's not having it. So when he's trying to get sneakily get David to go out, she's like, no. But what's interesting and we see in this kind of last scene here is there's multiple children here and yet they can't seem to use their powers like, you know, spread them out, should I say. And by that, I mean with Jill. Jill's kind of coming to the barn because she wants to rescue David, but they keep flipping around and putting all their attention on her. And then Alan starts to do something, so they flip back and they put it on him. And the focus is really on what Mara is doing and it's what she wants. And the children are just flipping from person to person to person to person. And what this does do, though, is it gives Jill and David a chance to escape and also this scene does show a lot of bravery with David as he pushes Mara to the ground to leave his mother alone. And Alan then gives them enough time to go. So he sacrifices himself and he blows up the children along with himself. And they do manage to kind of get into his thoughts. But by the time they do, it is too long. 
Out of this, though, David does get to leave with his mother. And while he has this power, you kind of feel like he's going to be okay. In the end, when it comes down to it, the arrogance of these kids got them killed. They felt Alan was there to assist them in their demands. They didn't seem to think they could be overpowered. Even though he blocked his thoughts and they knew he blocked his thoughts, they still didn't take the time to really wonder about this. The fact he was blocking shows he was up to something. As why would he do that if he was on their side? And while they were good at mind control, and don't get me wrong, that did cause a lot of devastation. They weren't that good at much else. And at the end of the day, they were just a bunch of kids with a bunch of demands and expectations and believed that their thoughts of what they wanted meant that they would get it meant that they were entitled to it. And to be honest with you, it's not much different to the kids today. The only difference is they haven't got the zappy thing. So thank God. Um, but would I recommend a watch of this movie? Yeah, go for it. I was entertained. And that is my little take on Village of the Damned. So if you want any more behind the scenes stuff, uh, you can find me on Instagram as Once Upon a Nightmare Podcast, threads as Once Upon a Nightmare Podcast, Facebook as Once Upon a Nightmare, and you can email me as Once Upon a Nightmare Pod at gmail.com. And you can also go and rate and review me on Apple, Spotify, and Podchaser. I do accept five stars, but four would be fine. <laughs> anyway, have a good evening. Chat to you soon. Stay safe. Bye.